Um, hi, I'm Kat. Um, I'm mentally ill. And that's not how I usually go around introducing myself to people. Hi, Kat. Um, but it's a big part of who I am. And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed that you know that. And I also want to tell you that, God, I love you guys. I love chefs. And I love the people who choose to make their living in food. And, you know, you're people, you feed people and you take care of them. And it's the thing that consumes you and, and the people you choose to spend all your time with. And uh, you, you wake up thinking about the food you're going to serve to people and how you're going to make it even better and, and make it perfect and how you can make your guests feel happier and, and feel taken care of. <sighs> but we're not taking care of you. You're not taking care of you. And you're not taking care of each other either. And you're too afraid to ask anybody to do that for you. And it's killing you. And it's killing this profession that we all love. And it's killing people. And there's not going to be a kitchen of tomorrow if there's nobody left. And uh, you, all, all the people who took the time and the effort and the money to, to get to this place today. Um, you're the people who are gonna have to solve this. And I wanna talk to you about a friend of mine. Um, is, and some of you know her by name or by her incredible reputation. And some of you know her very personally. Um, her name's Jessica Largi. And the night I met her, she won the uh, James Beard Award for Rising Star Chef in 2015. And I met her just a few minutes after she won the award, um, and she had been identified as one of the best and brightest hopes for the future of food. And I stopped her in the press room where I was working, and I was taking pictures of the winners, and I congratulated her. God, she looked amazing. And I'd never met her before, but there was, there was something about her and she really seemed like this blissful, happy, and, and balanced human being with this, this just gorgeous, like really serene smile. And I still love the picture of her that, that I took that night. There was, there was just so, something about her that was so compelling, and I wanted to know more. So um, a week or two later, I was putting together a panel of female chefs uh, in, in California, and I was moderating it. And I reached out to her, and I couldn't. I couldn't find her. Um, she, was, she was nowhere to be found. And I started hearing through the grapevine that she'd left her uh, position at Manresa, where she had been for years, where she'd, she'd worked up through the ranks uh, to become a chef de cuisine. But nobody could tell me where she was going next and, or even where she was right then. And they really couldn't tell me how it got to that place. Uh, where she decided to leave one of the greatest kitchens in America, working for one of the most extraordinary chefs of our time, who she loved and she admired. And she was stepping away not just from her job, which is one of the most coveted positions in one of the best kitchens in the world, but also from the people and the profession that had defined her every waking moment and consumed her soul and, and been her life for such a long time. And no one could tell me where she'd gone or why she'd gone away, and then she did. Um, she uh, showed up back in my life a few months ago, and uh, she wants people to know what happened. And she gave me permission to talk to all of you about it um, because she thinks it's going to help. Um, she wants to save this industry that she loves so much, and she wants to save your life. Um, she lost herself. It's what she told me. She said she, she loved, and she lost everything she loved and she valued about herself apart from her skills in the kitchen. Uh, I lost Jessica, is what she told me. I didn't know who I was when I wasn't at work. And even there, I'd become a different person. She loved what she was doing. And you make no mistake about that. She loved what she was doing. And she loved David Kinch, who was mentoring her and supporting her. Um, but the kind, as you all know, the, the kind of toll it takes on your life and on your personhood and your soul to do the kind of work she was doing calls for the exclusion of everything else in the world. The exact same things that make you the good kind of beast in the kitchen, the drive and the focus and the obsession and the demanding exactness, the directness and the utter intolerance for imperfection, 
can make you a mess of a human being outside of the kitchen. And so maybe, maybe there are some of you who can just check it at the door, go home, see your friends and family in the daylight hours, sit down, eat a meal with a knife and a fork, drink something that's not just out of a quart container, and be there to kiss somebody you love goodnight, make it out to celebrate your loved one's major life achievements, and successfully resist the urge to bark at somebody when they screw up a small task. I haven't met a whole lot of you who can do that, though. And uh, it got really, really low for Jessica. And while she was rising up at work, she was going through a heartbreak at home, and she found herself becoming angry and mean and a dark shadow of the self who she knew. Her partner told her she needed to get therapy and get help, and she didn't want to hear it. And like so, so many chefs, she just thought she could toughen up, work through what she thought was weakness. And the relationship ended, and the only thing that got her out of bed was work. 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hour days longer. She worked seven days a week at a restaurant that was open five, because she couldn't function otherwise. She didn't know how to be a person, just a machine who made flawless food. And she was, she was just angry at anyone or anything that thwarted that purpose. And she yelled and she raged and she went home and she hated herself and she felt sick and exhausted. And then she peeled herself out of bed and did it again and again and again and again. And does this sound familiar to anyone? Is this... And we're going to get back to Jessica's story, but if you're here, this story or something like it, it doesn't phase you at all. Just, this is just restaurant life, how it is, how it's always been, and how it's always going to be, right? Can we stop for a second and ask ourselves if it has to be? Can we allow ourselves the luxury, okay, just for a minute, and imagine and envision what it would be like? if the people around you weren't killing themselves to put food on plates and provide pleasure to people who have absolutely no idea what's going on behind the kitchen door. We have to, we have to, we have to, or more people are going to die. And this is not an exaggeration. In uh, February alone, in the shortest month, I know of three different chef owners who took their own lives. And those are just the ones I know about. Um, that's not counting like a line cook who overdosed or a chef de partie who drank him or herself to death in a slow suicide, just shift drink by shift drink and shot by shot. Or a server who accidentally stepped in front of a train or a car late at night alone. And collateral damage, we might tell ourselves. There are three in February. That's probably not above average, but who knows, because we don't talk about this. It's three in a month, which would be 36 in a year, which would be 360 in a decade. Chefs, gone. And this is a self-inflicted wound on the industry. And it's violence that's being done right in front of our eyes, and people are too afraid to speak up. And I know this because they tell me. Uh, and at this point last year, I wouldn't have believed that the issue was this big. I mean, I knew there was a problem. I would be interviewing a chef from my job where I worked at CNN or a tasting table. And I write pretty openly about my own uh, mental illness, my anxiety and depression. And there would inevitably become a pause in the conversation where we stop filming, where we stop talking. And they would say, hey, can we go off the record for a second? Can we talk about something? And they would tell me, hey, I've, I've been suffering, or somebody in my kitchen is suffering, and I don't know what to do about it. Okay, it happens once, twice maybe. And, and then it started happening the majority of the time, and I knew I had to do something about it. So on January 1st of this year, I launched a website called Chefs With Issues with the notion that I could set up a safe place for conversation about mental health and the industry and provide links to resources that people could use, um, mental health and, and money and, and hotlines and all that. Um, and I also put up a survey about mental health, because including a section where people could share more about their particular experiences, because I just, I wanted to get a sense of what people needed to talk about. Um, and I expected maybe a few dozen responses, maybe a hundred if word got out. 
Um, as of last week, I had 1,600 responses from people in the industry, mostly people in the kitchen. Um, I'm going to read to you what one chef sent to me. At times, my anxiety reaches such a level that I feel no human can withstand. I checked off all of the accomplishments on my bucket list in this industry, but I don't feel a sense of satisfaction. I make a lot of money, but I don't feel valued. I've missed so many life events, lost so many relationships. I didn't know this is what I was signing up for when I was young. Now mid-career, I don't know what else I could do with my life. Many of my role models have fallen apart. Some have taken their own lives. I feel like we're disposable, less than human. Celebrated for a season, then discarded as if we never existed. We identify ourselves so closely with the profession that I don't know what we are when we're not wearing the coat. When I get home, I don't know how to be a husband and father. My team consists of counterculture individuals who are so passionate about their craft, so wonderful and vibrant, but I see the path they're on and it hurts. It gets harder and harder to sell this business to young people, knowing that we're selling them a choice that many of us regret having made. Retiring from this business comfortably, I don't know what that looks like. I haven't seen it yet. But we chefs persist, we survive. Every night that we fall asleep sober or intoxicated is a victory, and some of us don't make it. And we mourn, but we don't judge because we understand. But not Benoit Vialier, I can never pronounce his name, I'm so sorry, doesn't have to worry about Michelin stars anymore. What's the worst case scenario? Hell, where it's gonna be hot and I'm gonna be judged? That sounds like a Wednesday. <laughs> Best case scenario, there's only stillness, nothingness, like closing your eyes in a swimming pool, maybe. No printer, no yelling, no financial statements, no expectations, no Yelp reviews, no critics, no exhaustion, no sense of disappointment. That's from a chef who's made it. This is the tip of the iceberg, and I get letters all the time, and strangers coming up to me. I have 26,000 words of stories that I have collected from chefs and their loved ones and their families and the people they have left behind after suicide, and they're in pain, they feel alone, and they're afraid to speak up. And I know this also because they tell me. So with this survey of the 1,600 people who responded who are mostly kitchen staff, 84.2% suffer, suffer from depression, 73.2% suffer from anxiety, 49.9% deal with substance abuse issues, 75.5% use alcohol to cope with the fallout from this, while other turns to drugs, compulsive eating, sex, or overspending. 57% of people said they couldn't say anything at all to the people they work with the people who they work next to every day, stay by, side by side, day in and day out. Why can't they tell anybody? Because 68.6% .6 don't want to be thought of as weak. 54.1% don't want to be thought of as crazy. And only 3.9% of people said their issues had nothing to do with the profession. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a statistician, and I don't work in a kitchen, but I don't think it takes much of a leap to realize that those numbers add up to a giant crisis in this industry that we all love so much. And that is one hell of a lot of people who are suffering and not speaking up because they're afraid of what the person next to them might think. And as a person who suffers from mental illness, I can, tell, I can tell you firsthand how much courage it takes to get out of bed every day, put on your game face, leave your house, and muscle through a work day with this massive weight strapped to your chest, not knowing how you're gonna take another step and somehow manage to get through, but you do what you need to do, and you turn around and you do it again, and that is real strength. And you're dealing with all of that, and you're going to have to worry that the person next to you on the line will know this about you and think less of you when you're standing there invisibly bleeding? That's ludicrous. And we can do better by each other. And what we can do is talk. And it has to start from the top, by which I mean you.
business owners, managers, executive chefs, celebrity chefs, <laughs> chefs to cuisine, maitre d's, line cooks, whoever here have people who report to you or who idolize you, you can drive the change. And I've seen it work. I've seen chefs like Ashley Christensen, Kelly Fields, Seamus Mullen, George Mendez, Angie Marr, I can go on. And these are all tough, strong, talented chefs who run their own kitchens and they command support from every quarter. I don't see them losing a damn thing by checking in on the emotional welfare of the people who work for them and being, being vulnerable in front of them. In fact, I see their staffs and the people around them look up to them as heroes, as mentors, as role models, and they stick around and they work their asses off for them. Let your staff or your peers, this isn't just for bosses, we can do this for each other, let them know that there is nothing to be ashamed of, that you're not gonna think less of them for being a human, that their job isn't in jeopardy, that there are less destructive ways to deal with stress. And I'm not saying it's not gonna be super awkward when your line cook is sobbing in front of you, but you'll both live through it, I promise. And back to Jessica. She realized that it couldn't stay that way. She wasn't gonna survive, not as the person she wanted to be. She burned it all down. She walked away from the job she loved. She sold almost everything but her cookbooks. And she's told me she rented a room like a college student. And she hiked and she walked and she talked and she just was a person. And after her James Beard Award, she was one of the hottest properties in the country. And she turned all the offers down, which is one of the scariest things a person could do. You strike while the iron is hot, because when's that ever gonna happen again? She started talking to a new business partner about a restaurant, and she told this person that she needed six months to learn to be a person again. Luckily, they agreed. She traveled and she ate all over the world and she wandered all over and she rebalanced her life the best she could. And now she's ready again. And in the spring, she is opening Simone Restaurant in Los Angeles and her number one goal is the health and wellness of the people who work there, including herself. And for herself and for her partner in the business, this means that there's going to be a mandatory six weeks off paid. And the people around her will get varying amounts of that too. I can't stress this enough. Mandatory paid time off. She's not hiring anybody she's worked with before because she doesn't want herself falling into old patterns. And she's going to try, try to close at the holidays so people can be with their friends and their families. She's offering yoga classes and to, and to her staff and subsidizing massages. She's eliminating tipping so her staff knows that they have a solid base and they don't have to worry about the whims of customers. She's gonna do her absolute damnedest to make sure that the people who work for her feel stable and balanced and valued. And she's scared, who wouldn't be? It's a gamble she has to take because we can't afford anything less. Thank you for listening. Okay.